We were asked to begin by revealing something about ourselves. So I will tell you this. At a critical juncture in my life, I fell in love with the scientific method. And I asked myself, could there be a more rewarding career than using the scientific method to uncover the workings of the human psyche? No. Today, I would like to share with you some of the fruits of that enterprise. Let me begin with a favorite quote. Benjamin Barber said, I don't divide the world into the weak and the strong or the successes and the failures. I divide the world into the learners and the non-learners. Why would anyone become a non-learner? We're born with such an irrepressible, exuberant desire to learn. You never see an unmotivated baby. <laughs> no, it looks wrong. Instead, you see babies being infinitely curious and addressing the most difficult tasks of a lifetime with tremendous gusto. Yet many of the things we are doing to motivate children, students, people, are making them into non-learners. What are these things and what can we do? That's what my work is about. In my work, we find that people can have different mindsets about their basic abilities. In a fixed mindset, people believe that their intelligence, talents, abilities are simply fixed traits. You have a certain amount and that's that. As you will see, this mindset can make people into non-learners because they become so worried about how much of it they actually have that learning can take a back seat. But other people hold a growth mindset. They believe basic human qualities, including intelligence and talents, can be developed. They don't believe that everyone's the same or that anyone could be Einstein, but they believe that Einstein wasn't Einstein before he put in many, many years of dedicated labor. In our studies, in one of our studies, we looked at students making a very difficult transition to seventh grade. Uh, we measured their mindsets by seeing whether they thought their intelligence was something they could develop or something that was just fixed. And we tracked their grades, especially in math, over the next two years. Although they entered with virtually identical past achievement test scores, their grades in math jumped apart after one term and continued to diverge over the next two years. The only thing that differed were their mindsets. How did this happen? Further analyses showed that those with a growth mindset put more emphasis on learning versus looking smart or not looking dumb, and also persevered in that learning in the face of difficulty. We found the same thing when we studied pre-med university, uh, pre-med students at an Ivy League university on the East Coast. Nobody cares more about grades than they do. But still, those with a growth mindset said they cared even more about learning. And it was this emphasis on learning that led to higher final grades in their organic chemistry course, the gateway to the pre-med curriculum. How'd they do it? Again, it was this focus on learning and the perseverance in learning in the face of difficulty, for example, poor grades on the first uh, exams in the course. Let's look at that process in the brain. A couple of years ago, Mosier and his colleagues um, studied, uh, did um, uh, event-related potential work on students as they performed a task and made errors. This hot, red-hot brain on the right is, uh, are the growth mindset students as they detected an error, processed an error, and corrected it. On the left, we have the fixed mindset students fleeing from errors as rapidly as, possi as possible. Barely any 
activity is seen from that part of the brain. Importantly, when they taught students a growth mindset, they started showing this processing pattern. How are mindsets learned? We've studied this in many ways, but one of the most interesting ways is through praise. We undertook this work at the height of the self-esteem movement when the gurus were saying, tell children how brilliant they are. It'll give them confidence and motivate their achievement. I'm here to tell you, praising intelligence does more harm than we ever imagined. In many, many experiments now, we've brought children in. Uh, we give them a set of problems to solve. Some of them are given ability praise. Wow, that's a really good score. You must be really smart at this. Others are given process praise, praise for their effort or strategy. Wow, that's a good, really good score. You must have worked really hard. There's also a third group I won't talk much about, a, a, a control group that's just told, wow, that's a really good score. In at least a dozen studies now, we've shown that ability praise creates a fixed mindset. It says, hey, I can see into you and see that your good performance was caused by some internal ability. It also makes students into non-learners. When you give them a choice of a hard task they can learn from, or an easier one they're sure to look good on, they choose the easier ones. They don't want to jeopardize their newly minted gifted label. And, and further, they show impaired motivation in the face of difficulty. If success meant they were smart, then struggle means they're not. But those who are given process praise, praise for effort or strategy, um, are um, uh, reporting more of a growth mindset. They are understanding from the praise that the fruits of their labor are what cause their good performance. They overwhelmingly choose the hard tasks they can learn from, and they show sustained motivation in the face of difficulty. Recently, we had the opportunity to collaborate with researchers at the University of Chicago to look at the praise parents give to their babies. In this study, uh, we, had, we coded videotaped interactions between mothers and their babies at one, two, and three years of age. And then we measured the child's mindset and desire for challenge five years later. We found that the more parents gave process praise to their babies and toddlers, the more that child, five years later, displayed a growth mindset and desire for challenge. But is it fixed in stone? No. Can mindsets be changed? Yes. In one of our studies, we took students making that difficult transition to junior high, and we divided them into two groups. One group got eight sessions of fantastic study skills, but the other got eight sessions with study skills plus a growth mindset. The growth mindset sessions kicked off with this article. You can grow your intelligence. New research shows the brain can be developed like a muscle. And what they learned was every, that, that there are neurons in the brain, and every time they stretch out of their comfort zone to learn something new, the brain forms new connections. And over time, they can get smarter. We also showed them how to apply this to their schoolwork. What we found was that those in the control group continued to show declining grades. But those who received the growth mindset message with the skills showed a sharp rebound in their grades. And this result has been widely replicated. What do these kinds of interventions do, these growth mindset interventions, is they transform the meaning of effort and difficulty. In a fixed mindset, effort and difficulty mean that you're not good at this. Kids say it makes them feel dumb. But in a growth mindset, that's the very time you're getting smarter. 
can mindsets shed light on gender and minority um, uh, representation in academic disciplines? This is brand new research by Sarah, uh, Sarah Jane Leslie and Andre Simpion. They just presented it at a conference last week and were kind enough to share their slides with me. As we all know, women are underrepresented in many of the STEM disciplines, math, engineering, computer science, and physics. But women are also underrepresented in some key uh, social science humanities disciplines like economics and philosophy. So what do philosophy and physics have in common? What Leslie and Simpion measured in a large nationwide survey were the mindsets of people in the different disciplines. They asked them to agree or disagree with mindset statements like this. Being a top scholar in your field requires a special aptitude that just can't be taught, fixed mindset. When it comes to your discipline, the most important factors for success are motivation and sustained effort. Raw ability is secondary. They had a number of items like this, and they calculated the mindsets held by people across the various disciplines. Now, obviously, it's not one extreme or the other, and every field um, recognize that it was a mixture of the two. However, the correlation between having a fixed mindset about your field and female representation in that area was quite hardy, a 0.6 correlation. And it held both within the STEM field and within the social science humanity field. Philosophy and physics both heartily endorsed the idea that it was raw innate ability and not passion, perseverance, and hard work that got you to the top. Um, interestingly, uh, the field's mindset also predicted the representation of African American students. In follow-up analyses and a series of follow-up experiments, they showed that many females find the culture of genius to be uncongenial or inhospitable. We've shown that mindsets shed light on motivation and behavior in a variety of disciplines. We've shown that mindsets about willpower have an important influence on the exertion of willpower. We've shown that they play a big role, mindsets about yourself and your peers play a big role in adolescent aggression. But I'd like to end with some work that we're very excited about um, on the Middle East conflict. We wondered whether mindsets about groups played a role in people's attitudes toward their adversaries and their willingness to compromise for the sake of peace. So if you believe that groups have a fixed, inherent nature that will never change, will you be more intransigent than someone who believes that groups have a more dynamic nature that's potentially malleable? In our first study, we had a, a national sample of Jewish Israelis. We measured their mindsets, whether they agreed with items like groups can't change their basic characteristics, never mentioning Palestinians or Arabs. And then we assessed 100 questions later in the questionnaire attitudes towards Palestinians and their willingness to make major compromises for the sake of peace, like evacuating settlements or sharing sovereignty of Jerusalem. And we found a substantial relationship between the mindsets they held, the more they held a growth mindset, the more favorable were their attitudes toward Palestinians. And the mindset was more general. It didn't involve Palestinians. And the more willing they were to compromise for peace. In three subsequent experiments, we manipulated people's mindsets about groups and looked at their attitudes and their willingness to compromise. 
So we, again, we had Jewish Israelis, we had Palestinian citizens of Israel, and we had Palestinians in the West Bank, many of whom were members of Hamas and Fatah. Uh, they read either a growth mindset article or a matched article that tended more toward a, toward a fixed mindset. In the growth mindset article, they read about um, various groups who had once been bellicose but were now quite normal and, or even peace-loving. And they read that patterns of violence could potentially change over time because of changes in the character of the leaders or changes in the circumstances of the group. They weren't told change was easy or likely, but simply possible. What we found across the subsequent three studies was similar to what we found in the first study. People who learn the malleable beliefs had substantially more positive attitudes toward their adversary and were more willing to make major compromises for the sake of peace and even to meet with adversaries to discuss the prospects of peace. So I'll end by saying the next time you're pondering the question of whether something is deeply fixed or potentially malleable, remember that the answer you give yourself matters. Thank you. <laughs>